A good morning to you all. It has been reported that the one third of a man made global green emission are due to the food, which includes the production, processing, as well as the consumption. If we are to slow down this climate change, it is necessary to adopt the technologies that are advanced, sustainable, as well as eco-friendly. In addition to these, the technology should be profitable to the producer, compatible to the processor, and safe to consumer. Food industry, which is growing with a dynamic innovation and digital transformation in order to ensure the security to the growing population. In this context, it is necessary to know the technologies that are going to change the food processing industry. Hence, we are here to acquire the knowledge about food processing technologies that are emerging, sustainable, as well as which are our future. With this, I am Dr. Srinivas Kirijal. Welcome you all uh, on behalf of University of Horticultural Sciences and College of Horticulture, Engineering and Food Technology to this international webinar on emerging approaches in food processing technology. I welcome you all once again. Now I would like to request Dr. Mohan Nayak to welcome our today's dignitaries as well as participants and to uh, have the opening remarks to this today's session. Very good morning and uh, welcome you all for the international webinar on emerging approaches in food processing technology organized by the DSLD College of Horticulture, Engineering and uh, Food Technology. And this program is supported by the ICR, NHAP, IDP. And uh, for this program, we have received an overwhelming response of uh, 1,300 plus registration around the globe from the 15 different countries. We know that the world population is steadily increasing the capacity of earth to renew its resources to continuously declining. And consequently, the bioresources required for the food productions are diminishing and new approaches are needed to feed the current and future global population. In the last decades, scientists have developed novel strategies to reduce food loss, waste, and improve the food production and find the new ingredients and design and to build a new food structure and introduce digitalization and automation in the food system. 
by 2050 the world population is expected to reach 9.7 billion and ensure global food security will be priority the first step towards the food security is reduction of waste and food loss as for fao nearly 1.3 billion tons of food are lost or wasted in a food chain from production to retail and by consumer annually in addition, the economic barrier should be addressed to give the access to healthier, sustainable food to low-income consumers. However, the reduction of waste and economic barriers is not enough to reach global food security, but indeed to feed the world population of 2050, a food production should be increased by 70%. And the entire food system has been facing a new challenge of COVID-19 pandemic since December 2019, a new source, acute respiratory syndrome caused by novel coronavirus. As a first consequence, the lockdown changed the consumer purchasing behavior. At the initial stage of lockdown, the, pandem uh, the panic buying behavior was dominant, in which the consumer are buying the canned food and the processed food and stop killing them and leading to shortage of food in a several supermarket. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the vulnerability, vulnerability of food system and indicating that the aid for future automation, artificial intelligence, which helps to maintain an operational supply chain. The COVID-19 has showed the importance of designing food products that can help to boosting our immune system and avoid the diffusion of variants through the entire food chain. The additionally, the diet should be changed and really less and animal products, including more plants, insects, and microalgae-based products. And this change is necessary as animal-based diet less sustainable comparatively due to the demand for more natural resources. So the actions indeed in the area of food processing to develop the sustainable society, allowing the generation to of earth bioresources are several. There are including changing our eating habits and dietary choice, reducing food waste loss, preserving biodiversity, reducing prevalence of food related diseases and balanced, balancing the distribution of uh, worldwide. The development of emerging technologies in a food processing address the specific consumer needs towards safer, healthy and minimally processed food. These innovation process also lead the environmental friendly and the sustainable food manufacturing technique with low energy requirements and reduce water use and that overcome limitations of our food processing practice. With these words, it is a moment to extreme pleasure to welcome the, all the guests and all the participants who are attending this, this webinar uh, through virtual mode. So I extend particularly my wall welcome to our honorable vice chancellor, Dr. N. K. Hegde, sir, University of, of Horticulture Science, Bogalkot, and who is uh, his, uh, irrespective of his busy schedule and uh, travel, and uh, he's going to address us uh, for this program. And uh, I welcome you all, uh, welcome you, sir, for behalf of this organizing committee and the DSLD chef. And I bid a very warm welcome uh, uh, to mm -hmm. our register, Dr. T. B. Alloli, sir and uh, who is supported and irrespective of his busy schedule and the travel, and he's going to address about key uh, keynote. And uh, I will welcome you uh, on behalf of uh, DSLT chef and organizing <laughs> committee. Welcome you, sir. And I bid a warm welcome to uh, PI NHEP Dr. RK Mesta, sir, for his uh, constant support and uh, approval for this uh, uh, program. And I will welcome you on behalf of organizing committee and the DSLD chef. Welcome you, sir, for this program. And extend a particularly warm welcome to our dean. He is the real instrumenter for this program, Dr. Lakshmi Narana Hegde. Sir, welcome you, sir, for behalf of this, uh, behalf of uh, DSLD chef and organizing committee. I welcome you for this program. I bid warm welcome to all the renowned speakers, particularly Dr. Professor Hosali Ramaswamy and Professor Yusufir Rahman and Dr. Laudip Khaur for accepting our invitation within a short day, uh, uh, within a short duration of time. And uh, I welcome you all the 
uh, speakers and the delegates uh, for uh, this uh, international webinar. And I extend my uh, warm welcome to all the participants, who the, those who uh, around the globe and over the 15 countries, uh, participants from the 15 countries are participated, uh, namely India, Netherlands, Denmark, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand and Turkey, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Romania, and various country. I welcome all the participants and I also welcome all the participants of DSLD CHEFT and uh, all the uh, staff of DSLD CHEFT. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohan Naik. Now, uh, I request Dr. R.K. Mehta, the principal investigator, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. R.K. Mehta, principal investigator, NHEP IDP, UHS Pagal Court, uh, to brief about NHEP IDP program to our audience. So, please, over to you. Okay, thank you, and uh, once again, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, distinguished guests, our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. N.K. Hegdeji, Registrar, Dr. P.B. Haldoji, uh, Dr. L.N. Negade, Dean, College of Horticulture and Food Technology, Horticulture Engineering and Food Technology, and uh, other uh, distinguished speakers today who are delivering their uh, valuable talks. So let me just uh, brief you about the NAGP activities uh, and uh, very purpose of this uh, organizing uh, webinar. So first of all, I congratulate the organizers for organizing this one. As you are aware, this NHP National Agriculture Higher Education Project has a sanctioned an institutional development plan for the University of Horticulture Sciences Bible Code. And this very project is funded by World Bank in collaboration with ICR and a fund of 657 lakh rupees has sanctioned during the 2020-21 and this project is running since last two years and at present we are in the fag end of this project uh, this project is going to be closed or completed by December 2023 uh, during this project I mean in the project we have established so many infrastructural facilities like uh, e-studio, language laboratory, sewage treatment plants, and even uh, for the incubation also we have um, set up the incubation lab and all. So apart from this, the very objective or the purpose of this very project is to create an academic ambience in the university, uh, which is equivalent to the any world-class university. So in this context, uh, we have uh, done so many activities. And at the same time, to create or uh, to motivate the students to take up entrepreneurship and also to make them competent enough to seek a job at any industry. So that is also one of the associated objectives of this particular project. So under this project, we have, concluded, we have done so many entrepreneurship development programs from the very competent uh, institutes across India. And <clears throat> well, accordingly, the students have been trained and they were asked to present their business models and uh, accordingly they were sent to national level and international level trainings also for speeding up or fine tuning their business plans and uh, to give them a maximum exposure at international level. Last year, 40 students have participated in different training programs across uh, different four countries. And this year, again, 40 students are planned to uh, go to uh, this uh, sort of uh, training program. At the same time, uh, 16 faculty have also visited abroad to fine tune their skills. So during this project to increment, uh, to create academic ambience, we have created again different visiting professorships also during the December month, four visiting professors from different uh, universities uh, from uh, Italy and uh, other European countries are visiting our institute. And uh, in this, during this project, we have also conducted some webinars to give a maximum exposure for our students and faculty to the scientists from world-class institutes. 
So such so today's webinar is also one such type of webinar which is organized under this project. Already we have organized seven webinars from different experts across the globe. Uh, so overall, this program is very very helpful as it is uh, opened by any GP headquarter. And as far as today's program is concerned, I'm very much thankful for the organizers from the College of Horticulture Engineering and Food Technology team, Davios. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to brief you about the activities of NHPIDP. So thank you and over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sir. Uh, really, we acknowledge your support as well as motivation to run uh, our the programs successfully. Now, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. T.B. Haloli, Registrar, University of Horticulture Sciences, Bagal Court, to address our participants about the event. Over to you, sir, please. Good morning to everyone. Dr. Lakshmanan Hegde, Dean of the Very College, nice, Dr. Mohan Naik, the person who is uh, instrumental in uh, conducting this program, our Honorable Hoshe Nassar, Dr. N.K. Hegde, and Dr. Mesta, who has, uh, I think, given uh, the financial help as a head of this uh, <coughs> IDP program, and uh, Kiran Nagarjanavar, who is co-coordinator and associate professor of food process engineering at this college. So I am very happy to know that DSLD College of Horticulture, Engineering and Food Technology is hosting this webinar, which is very relevant because nowadays the food processing technologies are becoming a very convenient tool to address several problems of agriculture. As you are aware, with the passage of time, Agriculture has undergone, including horticulture, you can say, has undergone enormous changes in many aspects. For example, adoption and de development and adoption of this uh, cultivars and hybrids, and development of new strategies, as far as uh, development of new strategies and also chemicals, as far as uh, to in order to supplement the no, uh, nutrition to the plant as well as the chemicals for pest management and also development of new rootstock as in case of horticulture. So likewise, uh, if you see the post uh, green revolution era, there has been a tremendous increase in agriculture production or horticulture production for which uh, we must express our uh, gratitude to all the scientists of agriculture and other biological sciences who have made it. But now the problem is, after attaining self-sufficiency during this post-green revolution era, the farmers are facing various problems, especially in the horticulture field, uh, in which uh, horticulture field, where the perishable commodities pose uh, mm -hmm. greatest challenges as far as their disposal is concerned, means marketing. So in view of that, this uh, food processing technologies and uh, other related issues certainly helps farmers to address the issue. So in India, as you are aware, I think most of these uh, agriculture scientists, uh, there are several crops where the percentage of post harvest loss is even up to 80%. Sometime it may exceed more than that. So this is one uh, important criteria which you have to address, that is, the post harvest losses can be minimized by applying the latest food technological tools coupled with this engineering inputs. And in my opinion, second, there are certain commodities, both agriculture as well as horticulture, wherein the farmers have to face the market glut. So, for example, tomato and chili in some part of Paranda, especially polar. However, whenever there is a excess production of tomato and chili, farmers will express their anger by throwing the products on the road. So under such circumstances, it is the duty of every agriculture scientist and policymakers to develop a device, develop a technology that addresses such a glut in the market. So I hope this establishment of this DSLD college 
in this part of Karnataka under UHS Bagal Court has certainly addresses some issues. And uh, this webinar is uh, certainly going to open, uh, I think, uh, it becomes an eye-opener for many of the students who are uh, still under the uh, under study. So especially uh, this uh, food technology, though it is not a new thing for Indians, food processing or food technology, since time immemorial, our ancestors are applying their uh, conventional methods to prepare so many products. So even now also in village, people prepare sweet out of sugar as well as this Bengal gram. But food technology, scientists will give a new uh, dimension to it by applying the qualitative parameters to overcome any type of uh, this uh, adulteration and other things. So this way, the uh, <coughs> this development of this food technology needs to be further strengthened across India and uh, different states so as to avoid uh, this market glut in horticulture, especially horticulture crops. So, we are, since uh, I, I am uh, once again uh, reiterating the need of this post uh, this uh, food processing technologies and post harvest technologies, which have a tremendous potential to address uh, many problems like the unemployment, market glut uncertainties in market and also to enhance the value of the product when we go for product diversification. I hope and wish that the newly recruited all food technologists in this DSLD uh, chapter college have, have to take oath to develop such a technologies which can address the post harvest problems of the farmers of this region. So I congratulate for having uh, arranged this uh, particular webinar, which is a uh, very uh, timely and relevant. I also appreciate the stand of our uh, Dr. Mesta, who has given a opportunity for this college to conduct this uh, this one financially. I think so. At the end, I wish to conclude that I convey my heartfelt thanks to our uh, <clears throat> Dean of this college, Dr. Elaine Hegde, and Mohan Kumar, who is instrumental in arranging this, and also Srinivas, as well as our uh, friend, uh, Kiran Nagarjuna, for arranging this. Thank you, one and all. Thank you uh, very much, Chair, sir. We noted the significant input and uh, research challenges that are evolving in uh, food processing and technology, sir. Now, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. N.K. Hegde, to address our participant for today's session. Over to you, sir, please. Good morning. Good morning to all, all uh, delegates and uh, participants. Good morning, sir. On this uh, webinar, international webinar, at, entitled Emerging Approaches, Approaches uh, in Food Processing Technology. Uh, these approaches are changing, as we know, uh, for every 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. Coming to our scenario, in India, we were collecting the food in the name of nomadic agriculture. It was the tradition of collecting the food from uh, uh, forest. Now it is agriculture, horticulture, and now we are about food processing technology. I appreciate uh, the organizer for arranging the event particularly Dr. Lakshmanana and Hegde and uh, R.K. Mesta and uh, the, the team of uh, involved, involved uh, teachers and uh, other supporting staff of uh, DSLD, Devi Hosur. Myself and uh, Dr. Aloli are uh, uh, joining from uh, Chitradurga on the way to Bangalore. And um, I have heard the uh, remarks of uh, as well as uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, T.B. Alloli. And it's uh, a timely, a timely and uh, most, uh, most relevant uh, decision to uh, arrange, arrange such a topic. It is an uh, international exposure, very much needed to 
have our institution at uh, 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 you know on par with uh, global institutions at least we shall make an attempt and we shall have to bring the change and per particularly i appreciate the uh, uh, contact uh, contacting and getting up experts from new zealand oman and canada uh, I, I think this uh, information that we get from these experts will be uh, will be uh, doc documented and made use of uh, made use of uh, and uh, 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 and the development aspect will be applied for the research, teaching, and extension of the college as well as in the university. Uh, coming to the uh, very, very topic of um, emerging approaches in food, food processing technology, as I have told, there's changes, uh, changes from food shortage to food abundance. Earlier, we are thinking about thinking or saying about the food security. Uh, we have so we have attained food security in India. Now we we have, uh, earlier there was a starvation death. Now uh, the situation is reversed. Many of the patients in the hospital are due to gluttony or excessive feeding and imbalance in nutrition. And we thought of nutrition security. Uh, we encourage horticulture. Now we have sufficient food in horticulture. Sufficient food in horticulture uh, to supplement the nutrition. And balance nutrition is question. Now, uh, at present, during current dec decade, the approach is for food safety. The food that we get is uh, again uh, polluted, and uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, having a contamination with heavy hazardous metal, metals, heavy metals, and uh, uh, food safety is in question. Now uh, we have to worry about food quality. Now, there is a long way to go, go for uh, attaining uh, uh, this quality food. And uh, this uh, food pro food processing technology will uh, with the network question. Is it edible? Audible? Yes, sir, it's, it's audible, audible, sir. Yes, sir, it's, it's audible. audible. Okay, okay. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I will uh, give some more remark. We uh, now I was discussing about the uh, nutrition, uh, food safety, and uh, role of food food processing technology. Uh, uh, as we have already discussed, uh, as already pointed out by Dr. Alloli, uh, it is the uh, situation where we have to, uh, wherein we have to bring change and uh, adapt accordingly. <clears throat> this uh, uh, in uh, India, we are we are saying about the regional and seasonal food. Yeah, uh, year-round food is uh, available either one part of the uh, country or other other part, and, and uh, now seasonal world. Uh, it, it may not be relevant if uh, food processing technology is made use of. The seasonal food will be available throughout the year. And um, uh, uh, now uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, topic discussion will uh, ignite the minds of young uh, students uh, to take up the research and uh, make use of the available technology to bring the changes. Now it is the era of uh, innovations and creation. This uh, ideas of technology and linking with uh, our uh, online platform, digital platform is in need of the day. And uh, uh, that should be availed for uh, take, uh, taking the food. Maybe uh, more, Dr. Mohan Naik was telling about the minimal processed food. We know that uh, fresh food is always good, but uh, it's not possible to feed the mass throughout the year uh, with this uh, fresh food and supplying it uh, through, uh, in, uh, in time. And we, uh, then we have to go for Processing, you are using the word minimal processing. Minimal processing or uh, processing in a, in a safer way. It's the need of the day. And uh, we have to avoid uh, junk food and uh, polluted food and uh, uh, resort a way to uh, produce, preserve, and uh, supply it to the needy consumers in time uh, for, uh, the, um, uh, for the need of the human health, human health in general. So, so we we have a word shari shari ramadhyam khalu dharma sadhan. We have to maintain our health and contribute for the growth of our country. And this is a, this is a very very relevant uh, topic and relevant thinking. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, under uh, under IDP, yes, uh, international seminars were not uh, arranged. And this is a good thinking. And uh, I, I hope uh, this uh, that uh, this will uh, again as I, as I have already told it will be documented and made use of. That's very important. I or I request the organizers to uh, document very uh, very innovative and relevant ideas of this discussion and uh, make use up in their uh, 
uh, institution as well as uh, in the our you know in our university i once again thank for your uh, thank for the opportunity thank you one and all uh thank you very much sir uh, for your valuable suggestions and consistent uh, support uh, for us in organizing such a event now uh, i would like to call uh, dr lakshmi narayan hegde uh, dean dsld chef devi yasur to have a presidential remark for this event thank you what to you sir thank you good morning uh, to the participants of uh, asia and europe and uh, i profusely thank our honorable vice chancellor who is in spite of his traveling uh, both the uh, registrar and him they uh, heeded our re uh, no, uh, request and uh, they addressed the uh, webinar i now written the webinar but uh, i am very happy to uh, note that more than 1300 registrations have been already made and many are on the youtube live this shows that how much people are interested in food processing technologies that to emerging technologies i believe in one saying uh, from upanishad ano badrah krato yantu vishvatah let all the good things come to us uh, in that sense uh, we uh, appreciate the uh, efforts of uh, our uh, dr mohan who invited the eminent personalities in the food processing technology uh, from east to west from new zealand then uh, we are halting at the oman then to the canada three eminent personalities in the field of food processing technology they'll be addressing us uh, the participants and also particularly our students of all the constituent colleges uh, in the our college in particular the btech food technology students in particular because the food technology is a, a new emerging uh, you know uh, field compared to agriculture field and horticulture field uh, we have a limitation uh, because we cannot increase the area of production uh, area of uh, cultivation for production of our food to in indefinite way, you know uh, way there is a limitation for that one side is this and the another side is we are what we are producing it's being wasted the majority the, when it uh, in 2 uh, 3 decades back it was 40% now it has come to 14 to 16% depending on the crop in that sense the role of food technology is very 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 essential that to uh, the era has gone now probably we have to eat quantity that is gone now it is only the quality food you have to eat it's not the quantity that the technology is emerging uh, for uh, production of for the uh, production of better food quality food that i read uh, the experts one dr lavdeep kaur from new zealand then uh, dr uh, rahman from uh, oman and also dr hosaldi uh, ramswami from uh, magill university canada they accepted our invitation in spite of their busy schedule they have accepted and uh, we are all eager to listen to their uh, you know expertise uh, this is very apt because this month we are going to celebrate the international food day or world food day uh, that's why uh, fortunately we are fortunate if everything goes well as per the plan uh, dr sam or ram sam will be here in our college uh, on 25th probably if it goes very you know as per our schedule uh, in that sense uh, i really thank the uh, our honorable vice chancellor and also registrar and dr mesta who uh, wholeheartedly supported us for our programs in spite of his limitations uh, in extending the support uh, and also i hope the participants will take the fullest advantage of uh, their expertise the experts uh, opinions and also they'll have a very good discussion and continuously there will be contact with them and uh, uh, i hope the our purpose of uh, conducting this webinar will be very very fruitful thank you one and all thank you sir uh, we are at the end of the program uh, nice. session now i request dr kiran nagachan our the coordinator and associate professor dsld chef devi yosur to extend the vote of thanks to our dignitaries as well as the participants over to you kiran thank you sir. thank you sir
ಸಪೋರ್ಟ್ making this program success i am grateful to our registrar dr tb alloli the former dean of our college esl teacher for his continued support to organize such events turning to our attention to our distinguished guest speakers dr laudip kaur from masi university new zealand dr shafir rahman from sultan tubas university oman and dr Sally Ramaswamy from McGill University Canada we are fully pleased that they accepted our invitation despite of their busy schedules to share their individual experience in the webinar on behalf of our university we extend our heartfelt thanks to each one of you sir we also express our gratitude to our lovable dean for our uh, for your presidential remark and motivation in organizing this event this program would not have been possible without the generous funding of nhp idp which dr mesta as a pi of idp sir I sincerely thank you for your supports and dr mohan naik our assistant professor for his instrumental role in coordinating with all the delegates we appreciate the active participation of all the attendees your interest and enthusiasm will undoubtedly lead led to further exploration in the world of food technology to this webinar lastly our heartfelt thanks to go to the organizing team dsld chef staff and dr shrinivas for carrying this event your hard work and dedication have been instrumental in making this program success thank you all for your contribution and participation thank you now now i request uh, dr mohan dr mohan yes sir okay, okay. please introduce uh, introduce about, about, about the uh, guest speaker, speaker laudip kaur mm-hmm. dear so, participants we will uh, start now our technical session and the first technician uh, technical session technical session uh, is uh, lecture is delivered by dr laudip khaur uh, dr uh, laudip khaur is presently working as a senior research officer and she is a, a doctoral uh, supervisor in a school of food and advanced technology masi university new zealand and uh, the feather among the world top 2 scientist in 2022 the list is published by the stanford uh, university uh, usa and she is the uh, associate investigator for redet center of research excellence new zealand and uh, she is the editorial board for the journal uh, the trends in food science and technology that is the highest impact factor of 16 and the editorial board for the journal foods and uh, see editorial board for the food science and the jo- animal science uh, uh, animal products and the see the co editor uh, for the popular book uh, called advanced in potato chemistry and the technology and as she is the co chair for the first international symposium on meat uh, chemistry and processing and nutrition in 2022 as she is uh, produced the more than 150 publication in her career with the uh, each includes uh, the top tier journal paper and uh, conference proceedings book chapter and technical and industrial reports and uh, this work also world first book editor entitled advances in uh, potato chemistry and technology the published by elsewhere academic press usa in 2009 and as followed by 2016 and her work has received an excess of uh, more than 10000 citation in a google scholar and uh, with an h index of 39 and many research has focused to solve the practical problems experienced by the food eaters industry and has been collaborating with the national and international food industry 
the supervised graduate and the postgraduate student and help in their research experimental planning and uh, polishing draft for the research reports and articles and provided guidance to help the succeed for their career. So the area of expertise are in field of ex, uh, expertise are agriculture and veterinary science, chemical engineering and food science, horticultural production, post harvest, uh, horticultural technologies, uh, rheology and transportation and storage. And she's mainly involved in uh, specific uh, research, mainly in muscle chemistry and processing, food microstructure, and digestion relationship, and in vitro digestion of foods, and uh, al uh, alternative proteins, the plant proteins, specifically the uh, kiwi fruit and uh, uh, protein digestion, and food matrix, and natural preservatives. Dear Madam, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and making this. Uh, uh, program uh, in a grand success. I welcome you, ma'am, on uh, behalf of organizing committee and the DSLD chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over Dr. to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohanaik, for your um, for the introduction. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Namaste and uh, kia ora from New Zealand. I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, this webinar, and I agree with the previous dignitaries who have spoken. Um, that the organizers, they have done a really good job of spreading the word around and that has resulted in so many people registering for the webinar. So that's really great. Um, also, I agree with Professors Aloli and um, Professor N.K. Hegre um, that um, uh, this, uh, this, this webinar is very timely considering the urgent action that's needed to bring changes to the way we grow and we consume our food. So also, I would like to congratulate um, Professor Mesta uh, for so many of providing so many opportunities, efforts, and so many activities for students uh, at national and international level. I hope that this is just the beginning, and there'll be more opportunities and possibilities to collaborate with your esteemed organization in the near future. So with that, I would uh, like to uh, begin my presentation at uh, today's lecture. And I will just uh, share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just get rid of some other things. Okay, well, so um, the title of my uh, talk is Sustainable Food Processing Technologies for the Future. And I think I don't need to, um, you know, go into detail why this is needed. Uh, you know, uh, people who spoke before me, uh, so they have mentioned the urgent need um, to explore uh, sustainable food processing technologies and you know why they are needed and so forth. So I come from Massey University, which is in New Zealand. And here, just to show you for uh, those who don't know where we are. So we are a little country. Um, just beside Australia. So you can see us on the world map, just, you know, it's a magnified version, but otherwise we are too tiny. So uh, just beside Australia and, um, you know, there are two islands and we call them North and South Islands. And Mass University has three campuses um, in the North Island. So I belong to the Palmerston North Campus, which is here in the lower North Island, but Massey also has another campus in Auckland, which is the big city, and also another campus in Wellington, which is the capital city of New Zealand. So I belong to School of Food and Advanced Technology with the main campus, which is which is just just here. And here's a photo from you know from my campus at Palmerston North. So, um, so why we are um, discussing sustainability? So, I think previously, um, you know, uh, the people who spoke before me, they mentioned about the rapid growth um, in the global population, 
So population is expected to grow to 11 billion by 2100. And many of the current food production or processing methods won't be able to feed everyone. So um, can you see my screen and can you see me as well or I've hidden everything? I'm not quite sure. It's fine, yeah, we can see both. Clear, no problem. Okay, great, yes. Okay, so apart from um, uh, the rapidly growing population, people are concerned about the environment because there's awareness among people they are concerned about the environment, what's happening you know, to the environment. And also there are concerns about health as well among people. So that has resulted in an increase in vegan and vegetarian diets among people. And people are opting for more plant-based um, alternatives. And people, although you know, in India, people are consuming, um, you know, it's a dominantly plant-based diet people consume over there. But um, here in Western countries, people are, um, you know, more and more trying to consume or switch from animal-based diet to plant-based diet. So there is quite a lot of awareness in Western countries as well about this fact. So people want to eat from um, more ethical and sustainable sources. So people are becoming more and more. And apart from that, because of health concerns, people um, you know, are demanding, consumers are demanding for minimally uh, processed foods because um, you know, there is a health scare that more processed food they're related to more diseases, so that's why people want to process their food less and less. And therefore, there is a demand among consumers for minimally processed foods. So again, um, touching upon um, the urgent action that's needed uh, because of the rise in world population, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Mohan Naik as well, the world population is going to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. And um, there'll be 70% uh, population would be living in urban areas by 2050. And this increase in population or the changes in um, the behavior of the population, people would be demanding for 70% more food. So there'll be a need for 70% more food, which means that if we don't make any changes to the way that we grow or process our food, we would need another planet which is not possible, there is no other Earth. So, um, you know, considering that we need 1.7 planets to, um, to curb uh, the demand for, for food. And, um, you know, this is uh, not possible by just achieving food sustainability. So environment sustainability and food sustainability, they go hand in hand. So they are inter interlinked. So that's why environment sustainability, um, if we achieve environment sustainability, then, you know, uh, we can achieve food sustainability and vice versa as well. So here I have given the population growth um, you know, um, graph and you can see the map. You can see uh, in India, the population is growing, uh, going to grow by 25% by 2050. But here in New Zealand and Australia, there'll be a growth of about 28% in the population. So we are going to grow. But if you look at some of the other countries, they are not going, there, there will not be much growth. There'll be just 3% of growth. But on the other side, if we look at some of the other countries, so they, uh, there'll be plus 99% growth in population. So there is a lot happening around the globe and we would need to consider how we are going to feed all these people. So again, um, two major contributors toward food sustainability, they are sustainable agriculture for the future. Um, and also another pillar is sustainable food processing. So we need to consider both. So um, if we could achieve a sustainable agriculture, at the same time, we need to achieve sustainable food processing as well. We need to process our food in a sustainable manner so that we can achieve the overall food sustainability. So here are some, some of the ideas um, in relation to sustainable agricultural, uh, agriculture or farming. So we would need a transformation of agriculture or farming, farming systems. So we would need to efficiently use our land and water. Um, but is it easy to, easy to do? Because there's not much time left until 2050. And what can we do? Um, is it feasible to do the changes that we are thinking that we can make, for example, can we increase the plant and animal food yields? Can we achieve higher yielding by using high yielding varieties and breeds? Or are the yields already at the peak? We don't know. And also, um, 
Uh, we can look at uh, growing low carbon emission crops like perennial grain crops, and we can look at alternative uh, farming ways. For example, we can look at hydroponics, sea farming, urban farming. Um, so at the moment, there is more uh, mostly plant um, farming, which is happening at the moment. So the overall goal would be efficient use of farming and non-farming land to grow more food, but at the at at um, you know without destroying our planet, beloved planet Earth. Does it mean that the chances of survival for the countries uh, that produce more and consume less food are higher? For example, New Zealand, we export 70% of our food. So does it mean that we'll be safe because um, you know, we, are, we are producing more food than we are consuming? So the fact that Japan imports 60% food to fulfill its total requirement, is it going to make it challenging for them? So, so we need to consider all those things, you know, they, because some of the countries, um, they produce more, they export more, some of the countries, they consume more. And, um, you know, so, so every country is different. So which would mean that in the future, we would need more strategies, new strategies and agreements among different countries. So just um, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, there are some key takeaways. Four of the world's dominant food producing countries, China, India, US, and Brazil, also rank in the top 10 countries in the world for total geographical land area. So in India, we have more land area, but we are um, among the world's dominant food producing countries as well. So US has long been a superpower in food markets and it's the only one of the world's largest food exporters. Um, China and India, um, as they are you know, large food producers, but they tend to consume much more of their food, own food products. So which means that um, with the increase in population, they might be able to just feed themselves, but might not be able to export a lot of food that they are producing or they, that they can produce in the future. So I like this slide because I've taken that uh, from my uh, son who studies in um, year five. So uh, he's quite aware of um, you know, uh, the issues around food security and food sustainability as well. And he has come up with some of the ideas. So, um, so we need to grow food, which does not damage planet Earth from a child's perspective. We need to grow food without the use of pesticides because we know that the pesticides, they, uh, they damage our environment. We need to reduce food wastes, um, not only at the farms, but also factories, supermarkets, and homes as well. So we need to consider uh, very wisely um, about, about that, how we can make use of the, um, of the waste that we are doing at the moment. Um, we uh, can use alternative farming, such as ocean farming, vertical farming, and urban farming. I recently went to Japan and I was very happy to see that they are much ahead of um, New Zealand. Um, I mean, uh, not, not in a, not in a, you know, that sense that I don't love New Zealand, but it's just that I'm uh, quite happy to see that they were, um, uh, their vertical farming was quite evolving, particularly in Tokyo. So I could see people planting at the top of the buildings. So, which is, um, you know, what this uh, vertical farming, urban farming is all about. So we need to start thinking about growing our own uh, food. We should all have our own kitchen gardens in our backyards. And also from an um, from industry perspective, we need to produce a better food that is better for the environment. And an example is um, a New Zealand company, which is, um, uh, its name is Silver Fern Farms. They have recently launched net carbon zero beef. So their net carbon uh, emission is zero. So they are not adding to the environment, uh, you know, the carbon, uh, they're not having the carbon footprint. Uh, that that food. So so we need more foods like that. So we need to have more and more net carbon zero uh, type type foods, which are um, better for the environment than the foods which can um, you know uh, add to the to the carbon emissions in the environment. On the other side, for sustainable food processing, we can look at different technologies. Um, so how the different technologies can contribute. So sustainable food processing, again, you know, uh, we as food scientists, we cannot do much without having strong interaction, collaboration with 
agriculture or farming sector. But at the same time, we also need to have collaboration with the health sector because people are going to consume the foods that we create and those foods should be um, having good health effects on the health of people. So we need to have collaborations at food, uh, as food scientists with agricultural scientists as well as with the health sector. So we can look at the technologies approaches to minimize food loss and utilize food that we consider as waste. So we need to convert today's food waste to tomorrow's food. And we need to look at new technologies, how we can convert today's food waste to tomorrow's food. And again, we need to look at technologies for preserving food. Can we preserve food for years so that there's no, no wastage? So we need to think about prolonging the shelf life of the food that we produce. We need to create um, nutrient-dense food. So I have shown um, world's most nutrient-dense food here, which is the Moringa powder. So it's, it's, um, it's very nutrient dense. So for example, can we go from having three meals a day to just one meal a day and fulfill our all, all, all of our um, nutritional needs from just one meal? So we need to look at technologies to develop food from whole of the food material rather than their fractionated ingredients. So you might have come across that people are fractionating um, you know, for example, proteins uh, or starches from, from plant-based crops. And then they're using those fractionated ingredients for making foods. But rather than that approach, can we use the whole of the material? Can we use, for example, whole of the peas rather than converting those peas, extracting protein from them? And then in the process of extract, extracting protein, we are creating waste as well. So instead of that, can we use the whole of peas rather than you know, fractionating protein from them? So there is a, there is a question, I think. Um, so somebody raised their hand. Somebody wants to ask a question. Ma'am, uh, we can have the interaction at the end of the session uh, at once. Okay, great. That will be better if you continue. Okay, thanks. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so can we, um, we need to look at uh, technologies to modify or process sustainable raw materials to create foods that match today's and future consumer expectations in terms of taste, texture, and nutrition. I've seen that there, you know, there is a, um, a lot of um, new plant-based um, foods which are coming into the market these days, but many of them are, are you know, are, are sort of a failure, which is, um, you know, a bit unfortunate because probably because they do not fulfill consumers' expectations in terms of taste and texture or nutrition as well. So first and fourth. Um, we need to create foods which meet uh, the consumer expectation in terms. It should be tasty. It should be its texture. Should be, um, you know, should be liked by the consumer. We shouldn't be creating foods which are not liked and therefore not. Um, we are not able to. We will not be able to sell those foods. So consumer meeting consumer expectation is really important. And again, we need to have um, collaboration with the health sector to find out what would be the potential effects of these transformations on our health profile. So we can create new foods, but we need to know, we need to predict what would be the effect on the health of the consumer of the new foods that we create. So what's the food industry's response um, you know, to uh, the issues around food sustainability? There is a lot of activity going on in the emerging protein space, but mainly plant-based foods. There is, um, you know, cell culture fermented protein foods available, but they're far too expensive. Only a few insect-based food companies are there at the moment. So current activities focused on plant-based foods, and therefore it looks like it will remain the key area of focus for producers for short to medium term. Countries like Netherlands, Singapore, Israel, they are investing, moving faster, and doing at a scale. So even they are faster than 
um, Australia and, and New Zealand. So um, we need to follow countries, um, you know, which are which are ahead of us, like Netherlands, Singapore, and Israel. So um, this slide tells about um, sustainable food processing. Um, you know how we can create new foods using sustainable food processing methods and utilizing the resources which are more sustainable compared to the others. So if you look at the left hand side of the screen. Um, replacing meat with sustainable plant ingredients. So why we why we say that um, meat is non-sustainable and plant-based foods are more sustainable. So um, so here is the grains that we produce and they they provide about six seven percent of the world's protein supply. And here is the livestock, for example, uh, chicken and beef and pork they provide 33% of world's protein supply. But in creating that 33% of the world's protein supply, they consume a lot of um, plant-based foods. So they are consuming, for example, chicken, they consume 3.3 kg of feed, which is equivalent to six kg of plant protein. So it doesn't look like it's, it's viable. So why not consuming the plant proteins directly rather than consuming the chicken? So, so that's why consuming plant protein is more sustainable because you need to feed chicken a lot of plant protein in order to get just one kg of meat. So that's why it's, it's highly unsustainable. So chicken is still sustainable compared to the other big animals, for example, pork or beef. So you need to feed the cow 25 kgs in order to get one kg of meat out of that. And similarly for pork, 6.4 kg of feed per one kg of meat. And that feed is usually, you know, plant-based ingredients. So, um, so I, I, I don't need to go through this. I think you uh, would have an idea about cultured meat and the plant-based um, meat, which is being created. And, that, and you might've seen a lot of um, foods which are available in the market. And most of these foods, they are plant-based and they are, um, created using the high moisture extrusion technology. So this is the Sunfed Chicken, which is a New Zealand based company. So they have created this product using pea protein. So they have taken, I think, Australian peas or New Zealand peas, and then they are turning that using high moisture extrusion into, um, into this product. And similarly, there are other products which are available and um, the main source for um, for these products is for these meat analogs is the plant-based ingredients. So I think beyond meat, they, um, they have more than one single um, source of protein for a plant protein in them. Um, so there, there, there'll be many more as well. Just, this is just uh, to provide you an example. So, um, so plant-based foods, they are challenging animal foods because they are considered environmentally friendly, healthy, natural, and sustainable. They're just considered environmentally friendly, healthy, natural, and sustainable. But at the, at the moment, consumers, they are not thinking about nutrition. So how these plant-based foods, whether they stand in front of animal-based foods in terms of nutrition, do they provide similar nutrition as animal-based foods? So flexitarians and vegans, at the moment, they are generally comfortable with their diets. But in the future, the consumers may become more aware of these aspects and will have changed expectations. And that will lead to demand for next generation of healthy plant-based food products. So just um, want to give you an idea about uh, New Zealand. So there is a growing consumer awareness uh, towards sustainability, health, et cetera. Changing food choices towards partial or um, complete replacement of animal protein in the diet. So I'm not sure if you know, but New Zealand produces high quality protein rich animal foods and ingredients. So we have uh, many dairy companies here uh, like Fonterra, so we produce a lot of high quality um, protein rich dairy foods as well as meat foods and ingredients as well. But uh, you know, considering sustainability, we need to transform our knowledge um, you know, of producing animal foods into non-animal protein foods and ingredients. 
we would need to diversify the food production system rather than replacement as the demand for New Zealand meat and dairy will still be there in the, in the world. So, so there is a lot of um, lot going on at the moment in New Zealand uh, in relation to diversification of our food production system. How do we answer the consumer demand for more animal foods by the middle class of developing countries? This is the question which we need to ask. Because uh, there is a rising middle class and you know, more and more people are wanting animal foods, although you know, it's still unsustainable, but how we are going to answer um, the consumer demand for, for these animals in the future. Maybe by creating meat-like foods, by creating dairy-like foods, um, which is why four scientists like me, so they are working more and more towards creating meat analogs, creating cheese analogs uh, from plant proteins. So New Zealand and food sustainability, what's our capability? We mainly grow, as I mentioned in the previous slide, mainly grow animal-based foods, dairy, meat, and some plant foods. So how easy it's going to be for us to switch over to the non um, animal production system. We have large pastoral area, so we grow a lot of grass, um, but how can this help? An established world-class farming and food processing industry we have. We have world-class scientific and technical expertise. We have awareness about agricultural and food sustainability, but there is still resistance to change from animal-based production to plant-based production. So it's very different than India where um, you know, we grow a lot of um, uh, plant-based uh, crops. So here, mainly we grow um, animal-based foods. So um, efforts um, in terms of agricultural sustainability, um, making animal food more sustainable. So whether we need to look at making it more sustainable, yes. And, um, and that's why there are more and more efforts towards making the food farming more sustainable here in New Zealand animal food farming. New Zealand's capability to grow, we need to work on that. We need to go, um, improve New Zealand's capability to grow plant-based plant foods. We need to, uh, to implement new policies to enhance plant-based food growing um, here in New Zealand. In terms of food sustainability, we need to look at technologies to create and utilize sustainable food ingredients for making future foods. Foods with very high bioavailability. For example, if you consume um, 100 grams of foods. There shouldn't be any food waste that goes out of your body. So all of the nutrients should be absorbed within the body. So that's what's called highly bioavailable. Climate and water smart food. We need to look at climate and water smart food process and also creating nutrient dense foods. And also technologies for low waste um, uh, to process low uh, technologies for waste processing and food waste utilization safely. But can we sacrifice taste? Maybe not, so um, we need to work on that. We still need to create tasty foods from the waste material that we are producing at the moment. We also need uh, foods with longer shelf life. We need to prolong the shelf life of the foods that we are producing. Can innovative processing technologies help achieve food sustainability? what the consumers are demanding. They are demanding new structures, textures, aromas uh, that mimic foods which are not sustainable, for example, meat. So they're wanting more food choices. They're wanting tailored nutrition. They're wanting access to safe food, to healthy food. They're wanting convenient food, considering the modern day lifestyle of consumers. And at the same time, it should be affordable. Environmental effects, in terms of that, um, we need to look at less waste generation, minimal processing where possible, and also reduced energy or water consumption. And at the same time, uh, considering both consumer demand and environmental effects, we need to look at feasibility for the businesses, for the food industry. What the food industry wants is faster operation, reducing the costs of processing so that they can um, use less manpower and they are looking at more automated operations and the use of artificial intelligence. They're looking at prolonging shelf life while maintaining quality. And also they need to look at circular operations so that they can utilize waste stream for food processing purposes and the ability to process new ingredients and waste streams. 
So there are a lot of things which um, we, we as food uh, technologists, we, we need to consider. So understanding the consumer is really important. So we have different consumers, we have different generations. There are five or six generations of grocery shoppers. So five generations at the moment, there'll be six generations coming soon. So they, have, they all have different food choices and demands. So if you look at uh, what I have um, you know, taken this um, from somewhere else. So if you look at the Gen Z, so what are they doing? So they are not big spenders yet, but they're dedicated to healthy food, organic food, and making frequent trips to the store. On the other side, millennials, they are using technologies to shop and save and are driven by speed, convenience, and variety rather than brand loyalty. So all of them, they have they, are, they spend in a different way. They have different food choices, um, but food choices are not just driven by age. So you just can't say that this is Generation Z, so let's put them in this bracket. It's not possible because this is not just driven by age. You need to consider the economic condition of the consumer, the cultural aspects, the health aspects, they all impact food choices. So each generation has their own priorities, but people just don't play by the rules according to the generation they are classified in. So the consumer, understanding the consumer is really important and tough at the same time. So we need to switch over from the traditional uh, processing, food processing, um, the technologies that we have been using in the traditional system to emerging technologies and approaches along the food chain. So not just um, you know, at one step of the food chain, but throughout the food chain, we need to switch over from the traditional system, which is considered mostly unsustainable to more sustainable, um, you know, where we are using emerging um, more sustainable technologies and approaches. For example, in order to prolong the shelf life of foods, we have been using thermal preservatives or chemical preservatives. For example, we have been using heat and we have been adding a lot of um, you know, chemical preservatives. But instead of that, can we just use those technologies? For example, can we use cold plasma technology, high pressure post, um, processing technology, pulse electric field? I'll be um, providing details about these technologies in the next few slides. So can we switch over from the use of these nasty chemical preservatives or thermal preservatives to more sustainable? These technologies are considered more sustainable, more friendly for the environment than the use of these chemical preservatives. And similarly, we need to be aware of how we are packaging our food. So at the moment, there's a lot of plastic, um, glass, cardboard being used for food packaging. We can move over from this traditional um, you know, packaging types to active or smart and modified um, packaging, edible coatings and foams to prolong shelf life of foods. And similarly, in terms of freezing or cooling, we need to switch over from the use of refrigerants, which highly, you know, they add up to the um, to the carbon emissions. So, you know, um, um, we can replace them with individual quick freezing cellulite system. So this cellulite system has been um, reported um, to be uh, preserving the quality um, of the food compared to the, you know, the other refrigerants or the other freezing methods. And similarly, if you look at the other, you know, the, the way we have been processing, we, way we have been storing food, we need to um, switch over to, um, to more sustainable approaches. And in terms of food waste, so what goes to waste, instead of just putting to landfill, we need to recover the nutrients from the, um, the food. So as much as possible in order to create novel foods and novel food active compounds, which are good for health. So we need to look at those approaches. Yeah. Okay, so um, what is the aim of um, using innovative food processing? So the aim is um, to improve food safety and quality, to prevent nutrient loss, to reduce waste generation, and they should be environmentally friendly and um, for sustainable food production. And at the same time, those technologies should be applied to various food formats. And by that, I mean, they, could, they should be applied to solid foods, liquid foods, semi-solid foods, 
and you know all sort of different different foods. There are different technologies like cold plasma, high pressure processing, electrolyzed water, pulse electric field, ozone. Some of these technologies are not yet approved for um, use in food, so they cannot be used in food applications. But in the future, people are doing more and more research. For example, uh, using electrolyzed water and ozone, um, maybe cold plasma as well, um, to see uh, whether they are safe to be consumed by humans. So um, the technology that I'll discuss um, first is high pressure processing. So this is a sterilization and preservation method. Um, so we use high pressures to inactivate microbes and pathogens and can be used for both liquid and high moisture foods and um, substantial water and energy savings can be done compared to the use of um, you know, other traditional methods. Because it requires less energy per kilogram of food than conventional thermal processes. And at the same time, um, you know, this doesn't come in direct contact. Uh, so you can put your food in sort of bottles or pouches and then do high pressure processing. And it maintains high sensorial and nutritional qualities. It doesn't damage vitamins like the thermal technology does. So this is the preferred method, although it's a little bit expensive from food, <laughs> food industry point of view. So um, at the moment, this is a product-wise use of, uh, I'm sorry, product-wise application of high pressure processing. So 25% um, use in meat products, 28%, sorry, 33% uh, for vegetable products, 17% for juices and beverages, and 15% for seafood and fish. So what's the pressure that's um, required for food processing is 200 to 800 megapascal is, we need to stay within that range. For commercial food products, 600 megapascal is the optimum pressure which is used for, used for processing. For if you are wanting to inactivate the milk enzymes, phosphate, um, alkaline, phosphate, and protease, about 1000 megapascal would be needed. So depending on what's the end application, you need to consider the, uh, the pressure that you'll be using. And also, I would like to add here that um, you know the the, the the pressure and also the time you expose the food material at that pressure um, that affects the texture and appearance of the food product. For example, if you expose meat, raw meat, raw chicken, for example, to um, to six hundred megapascal for ten minutes then at the end, what you're going to take out of the high pressure machine would be, would very much look like cooked chicken. So it changes depending on the pressure and the time you expose the food material for. So if you expose 600 megapascal for just one, for 30 seconds, so it might not affect. So, so depending on the pressure, you need to consider the changes that can happen in the food material as well. And based on that, you can choose your pressure and time. Comparison of thermal processing with high pressure processing considering the environmental indica indicators. So here are different indicators, environmental indicators, and I will just discuss global warming, for example, Yeah. So if you look at this, um, this bar graph, um, this is the high pressure processing percentage of environmental impact. So very little environmental impact compared to the conventional thermal processing, the retort processing. So this is how you process using a retort, for example, at high temperature. And this is when you use high pressure processing. So you have much less environmental impact when you use high pressure processing compared to um, using thermal processing. And similarly, you can look at the ozone depletion and many other things as well, and land use and you know, so many other things. And high pressure processing usually has a very little impact, um, mostly um, on all these environmental indicators. So what can we conclude? Um, so we can save, we can um, save water, energy using high pressure processing when compared to other food processing technologies. It requires less energy per kg of food than conventional thermal processes, and it doesn't come in contact with food products. And because of that, if it doesn't come in uh, contact with food products, you can reuse 85% of the water in um, that's used for high pressure processing. So now the second technology that I want to discuss is the pulse electric field. What is it? 
is generation of an electric field between two electrodes using electrical pulses for periods of time ranging from microseconds to milliseconds. So again, this technology has efficient energy uses compared to conventional thermal processing. PEF treatment, although the principle of PEF is very different than high pressure processing, which we discussed in previously, it's perceived as this is also perceived as environmentally friendly and economical technology for inactivating microbes and improving mass transfer in food products. So it's again here yeah, normal non-thermal processing of food in which electric um, pulses are used to preserve foods. So your food material is within um, uh, the two electrodes and you generate electrical pulses for a very uh, millisecond or microsecond like zzz, zzz, like that. One of the most processing technology due to reduced um, treatment time, fresh like characteristics of food, high sensory and electrical content suitable for preservation of liquid and semi-liquid foods. So not only preservation, but it has other um, uh, roles or other um, uses as well, this technology. Here are the different uh, uses and also how PEF contributes towards sustainability. So if we look at food security, it improves the food yield. So it improves um, PEF treatment of seeds, improves the yields. Uh, improves the yield. And also, if you look at um, uh, economical sustainability, reduced energy consumption. So PEF reduces the energy expenses of food processing by targeting cell membranes. So PEF is often used for the recovery of value-added food compounds. And again, for solid food pretreatment, so this is used for um, quite a lot these days for all the, by all the you know, fries manufacturers, the potato fries manufacturers, for example, McDonald's, and you know, so so those um, those fries manufacturers before using the potatoes for making fries, they give the the PEF treatment to the fries, and that softens the tissues, the um, softens the plant tissue, and it makes the cutting easier after that, and also the fries um, that come out after frying, they are more crispy compared to the non-PEF treated fries, the non-PEF treated potatoes. So this is, um, you know, um, just a comparison of PEF treatment with um, thermal processing, considering the environmental indicators. If you look at the fries pretreatment, if you do fries pretreatment, um, you can lower the, um, the environmental impact by 85%. And for treatment of apple and potato, you can lower the environmental impact by 90%. And for steam peeling of potato, if you switch over um, to the use of PEF, um, then you can lower consumption, energy consumption by 30%, and so on. So for drying as well, so you can see, um, you know, the energy consumption there. So there is an improvement in, um, in the required energy when you use PEF. So this is the next um, technique that we have um, used uh, in collaboration with DIL in Germany and in YE in France. So this is hydrodynamic pressure processing or shock, also called shock wave processing. So what you do here is you apply high pressure waves up to application of high pressure waves up to one gigapascal. So there's a lot of pressure involved in the fraction of a millisecond. And this has been reported to lead to improvement in processing with economic benefits. Uh, for example, in case of convenient, easy to prepare meat products or other food products as well. So this is the principle here. So you can have either the underwater discharge method or exploding wire method. So what does, this is the meat product or any food product here. And um, this is the underwater discharge method, method. So you create a discharge underwater. So is the merged in water and you create a, um, an electric discharge here and electric discharge will generate hydrodynamic shock wave and that shock wave within a fraction of a millisecond will um, reach your food material and will change the texture of the food material. So I will just play a tiny video to show you how this works and we have meat um, going under continuous operation 
for um, shockwave processing here. So you can see um, this is meat pouch and this is, um, this is continuous belt. So it's being submerged in water and at the same time being subjected to um, shockwave treatment. So we wanted to see uh, what's the effect of shockwave processing on the structure of meat. And we found that it had um, a significant effect on the secondary structure of the proteins which are present in the meat. And that also led to reduction in thermal stability of connective tissue, which led to an improvement in the texture. So the meat was more tender um, uh, when it was subjected to shockwave processing. We also tested the in vitro protein digestibility, and we found that the in vitro, um, you know, from the in vitro protein digestibility results, that the shockwave process sample had better uh, protein digestibility, which I will explain in detail in the last few slides. The technology that um, we have been testing is microwave or pressure assisted thermal sterilization. Although personally, I haven't used pressure assisted thermal sterilization, we do have access to microwave assisted um, thermal sterilization here at Mass University. Um, so pressure, uh, it requires both temperature, high temperature and pressure, but MATS doesn't require high pressure um, if it's just a temperature based system. So aseptically packaged foods are usually self, you know, when you use microwave processing uh, or microwave-based thermal sterilization method, um, then those packaged foods um, that you subject to them um, to mats, they're usually shelf-stable after the treatment. And that reduces the carbon footprint. So if you enhance the shelf life, so this is sort, sort of, um, you know, improving the, the shelf life of the foods using this technology. If you enhance the shelf life, you're reducing the carbon footprint during storage and distribution. So when you use microwave energy as an alternative to heating, that opens up the possibility of using renewable energy directly instead of steam. So both continuous microwave sterilization and pasteurization systems can be designed to minimize adverse environmental impact through efficient use of energy and water. What are the advantages or, um, of using microwave-based um, thermal sterilization? Cleaner work environment and uh, reduced use of plant space and shortened process, process time. Thermally pasteurized foods also do not require chemical preservatives. So you, you can have a clean label product because you don't need to add those, um, those chemical preservatives. So it's used for drying, extraction of bioactive compounds, for tempering of meat, and for sterilization um, as well. So this is a system that we have at Messi in the food pilot. It's the Kimpa system. It's one of the two systems which are available worldwide. Um, this is a rapid process by exposing food to high temperatures for much shorter periods than in the conventional retorting. So it does look like retort. But here, it's, um, you subject uh, food material to microwave energy. So there it has you know, microwave energy coming from these, I think these sensors there. Um, so while still receiving the necessary thermal treatment, so you, you generate heat through those micro um, radiations. So microwave uh, sterilized in packaged foods have already been commercialized in Europe and Japan. But what happens to food, or in this case, we tested meat under rapid, rapid microwave heating. So what do we do? How it's different than thermal processing? We took lamb and goat meat and we subjected to microwave. So what you do is you pass your, um, your packaged food, the trays, which are shown on the left-hand side, you pass through the microwave uh, radiations um, one time, two time, three time, four times. So here's the four passes, one pass, two pass, three pass, four passes. So this, this, um, this treatment was done just for five minutes. So within those five minutes, you pass it four times under the microwave. And after that, the food is cooled down, the trays are cooled down. And we wanted to see what's the effect on the raw meat texture after microwaving for just five minutes using this, um, this technology. 
and we compared it to cooked meat. So we cooked, um, we had a control, we cooked at 60 degree for nine hours because goat meat is tough, lamb meat is tough. So that's why you need to cook for a long time in order to achieve um, a suitable texture for consuming. So we compared the texture of the meat, which was cooked at 60 degree for nine hours versus, you know, which was microwaved for five minutes. And this is how it looked like. So this is lamb and this is goat meat. So this is raw before treatment, after treatment. And this is how the other meat looked like, which was subjected to nine hours at 60 degrees centigrade. We didn't use a high temperature. We just wanted to use a low temperature and wanted to see the effect on texture, color, cooking loss, etc. So you can see the, um, the texture I was pretty much similar to the sous vide cooked meat. So if you microwave, he uh, use the mats, then you can get the same textural um, value uh, that you can get after cooking for nine hours at 60. So it was very much consumable at this point, but the only disadvantage of this technology was there was a lot of cook loss. We found a lot of cook loss here um, in this uh, microwave cooked sample compared to the sous vide cooked sample. So this is how the structure looked like under, um, under the micro scanning electron microscope. What we found was microwave um, treated meat had set Z dust disintegration. So the structure was disintegrated by the microwave yeah. treatment. And that's why that's that's what led to um, you know tender meat in very short. Tender meat within a very short span of time. We've also checked the effects on protein digestibility, and we found that microwave processing did not have any effect on the protein digestibility. And again, we tested another technology where we tested um, kiwi fruit enzyme pretreatment, and we found that the kiwi fruit enzyme pretreatment significantly reduced the cooking time for top meat cuts. For example, if you, um, you know, in this case, we use brisket, and usually you need to cook brisket for 20 hours. Uh, this was at 60 degree for 20 hours. And if you give kiwi fruit enzyme treat meat treatment, you can reduce it, the cooking time from 20 to 0.5 hours, which is half an hour. So you can reduce the cooking time um, from 20 to 0.5 hours and this is um, the process that we developed at Massey University. Um, it's a pilot scale process uh, that we developed and we found that um, the product quality was great and protein breakdown rate um, also was improved under in vitro digestion conditions. And here is how we injected the kiwi fruit enzyme into the meat. So we gave the injection and after that we cooked for half an hour and that led to the same mixture as the, as the sous vide cooked meat. And then there's another technology that we have been working with is 3D printing. So, so can 3D printing help achieve food sustainability? What are the strengths and what are the limitations of this technology? So the strengths are it can create food textures, structures, and aromas, um, which are new. Um, and it can allow the use of new ingredients. And therefore, it will lead to more food choices for consumers. And also, you can work with tailored or personalized nutrition. And there'll be less waste generation. You can just print your food um, at the press of a button. But what's the limitation at the moment? At the moment, the printing time is very, very long. And also mimicking the key textural properties of real protein foods, for example, meat analogs or cheese analogs um, is, is, is a challenge at the moment. So what's happening in the, um, in, the, in the literature? So in the literature, the publications are on the rise, as you can see, from 2013 to 2021. So the publications have been rising quite a bit. So there's more and more research and more and more interest um, in the 3D board printing at the moment. 
So what is 3D printing technology? Prints three-dimensional objects using stacked layers via computer model program. It requires a food design program to design and implement procedure algorithm, um, a 3D printing device for layer-by-layer -layer continuous deposition of food material, and also you need an ink, which is traditionally chocolates, jellies have been used, but there are so many uh, opportunities in the future. So you can print anything. Anything should be possible to print in the future. But you need to give a post-cooking, uh, post-processing treatment. So after 3D printing your food, you need to cook it after that, before consumption. At the moment, the printer type, which is, interest, uh, which is being used um, in food technology, is extrusion-based. And uh, yeah, se uh, several researchers, they have tested soft foods such as um, try printing chocolate, uh, cheese, dough, and meat puree. What we have done is we have tried printing hybrid meat analogs. So what do I mean by hybrid is a next generation of meat analog, which is prepared by when you process plant and animal protein ingredients at different ratios. Um, so why there is a need to add animal protein and why there is a need to add hy have hybrid meat rather than plant-based ingredients. I'll be discussing that um, in detail later on, but I can, what I can tell you right now is animal proteins, they are more nutritious compared to plant-based proteins. So that, therefore, if you combine the two together, you can get all the nutrition from the animal proteins, but at the same time, the food that you will be making at the end would be more sustainable because you will be using mainly plant-based ingredients. So 3D printed soft textured meat analogs need to be developed due to their suitability for elderly, like our, um, you know, our grandmothers, grandfathers, they are not able to consume hard textured meat. So for them, we need to develop soft textured meat analogs. And there is development of plant and animal based formulations for 3D printed hybrid meat analogs. So this is what we have done in our, in our laboratory. So we have tried creating uh, uh, a chicken-like structure. So chicken breast-like structure using um, plant proteins only and also combination of plant and animal proteins. So this is what we get so far. And we have published this work in the uh, so it's, it's there, I'll provide a link. Uh, I think it's in the next slide. So this is how the, the texture looks like. Um, so this is um, from combination of chicken plus, I think it was pea protein. So again, the drawbacks uh, are lengthy printing times, commercialization restrictions, and you also need to cook the meat or the, you know, the food afterwards. But advantages are you can work with, uh, you know, whatever you want to work with. You can create new textures, flavors, and they'll be less. So this is a paper in case you want to um, read more about what we have done. Um, there'll be details in this paper. So um, again, we have done some more work in um, utilizing plant-based ingredients to make meat analogs. Uh, so at the moment, there is high moisture extrusion, which is being used to create those meat analogs. And there is another method which is being explored is shear cell, wet spinning and freeze structuring. But at Mass University, we have patented a new technology, which we have named as high temperature shear processing. And the patent is available online. You should be able to have a look online. Um, uh, and we compared the R process, which we have patented versus a high moisture extrusion processing. And that, um, that process for creating these hybrid meats using the new technology that we have developed, um, that, that uh, like I said, that has been patented and that was on TV as well. That's
Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, can you can uh, yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, I thought sorry. some problem is in the network. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so should I go ahead now? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great. So, yeah, I was mentioning about the um, the patent that we um, recently have captured. Um, so it's around uh, new technology to create hybrid meats. So these are the foods that were developed using this technology. And these foods were served to the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and her colleagues when she visited Massey University. And we have published a lot of literature around protein restructuring using thermomechanical processing. So we would be happy to collaborate um, you know, in this, this area as well. So again, we have been doing some more work in relation to uh, looking for more natural preservation compared to the chemical preservatives. As mentioned before, chemical preservatives, they are related or linked with bad health effects. So particularly sodium nitrite, which is being used in processed meat products. So um, we have been looking at replacing sodium nitrate with more natural um, alternatives, more natural sources. So here is just comparing traditional versus new food preservatives. So what people have done, um, this is a conventional um, preservative. This is organic acids, which are more natural. And here's a plant extracts and oils which where people have looked at. Um, these oils as a source of preservation. So, so here is um, effective use um, levels against microbes. So you need just less than 0.1, but you need a lot more of those plant extracts or oils because they are not that concentrated. And um, they're effective against those plant extracts and the oils, they are effective against um, fungi and some bacteria. But at the moment, the safety aspects, they are unknown. So the majority of these plant extracts and oils, they are not permitted for use in food applications apart from rosemary oil. So their commercial use is unknown and the supply is still not established. Um, and they can, they also have some other uh, product formulation related disadvantages. So we need to do a lot of research um, in case we want to um, explore the use of these natural plant extracts or oils um, as a source of preservative. So what we have been doing is we have been exploring Manuka, which is the plant which is shown here. So it has a very nice, pleasant smell. Um, so there is, uh, you might have heard about Manuka honey. So, um, so I'm talking about Manuka extract, not honey. Manuka extract or oils. So the, um, the extract or oil from the Manuka plant um, which is widely grown as a shrub, um, grown distributed throughout New Zealand. And um, it's known for its antimicrobial and also antioxidant properties because of the presence of a very unique um, compound beta triketones. So Manuka was used in New Zealand to brew tea and beer by early settlers in New Zealand. And Manuka plant um, is considered as a tanga by Maori, who are the natives of of um, New Zealand and therefore has a deep cultural importance. And as I mentioned before, extracts or oils of Manuka and Kanuka, there's uh, another sister plant. They are well known for their medicinal properties. And they are sources of um, monoterpenes, cisketerpenes, hydrocarbons, and, and triketones. So these beta triketones, they are very important to consider because they have very strong antimicrobial properties. And in case you want to know more about our work on Manuka, so we have published a lot on um, the use of Manuka extract, the use of rosemary oil and extract um, you know, for food preservation in comparison to the chemical preservatives. And we are still doing a lot of um, you know, research in this area. So now the second part of my, um, um, my talk is about understanding the health effects. So we can create sustainable foods, but what are the health effects? We need to consider those as well um, of the new and emerging foods that we produce using these novel technologies that I talked about. 
So majority of these technologies um, will be using because plant foods are more sustainable. So we will see more and more use of those plant-based ingredients in the future. But plant foods, they tend to have a lower protein nutritional value than animal proteins because they lack, they're lacking in essential amino acid composition. So lysine is the primary limiting amino acid in cereal proteins, whereas methionine and cysteine are in pulse proteins. And again, when you're isolating protein, for example, from soya bean, when you isolate protein, you can have strong effect on digestibility. The protein can become highly unbioavailable or less digestible because of those strong isolation procedures that are being used for extraction. The digestibility of amino acids is variable depending on protein sources, anti-nutritional factors, and processing methods, and could be influenced by components of food metrics. So there's a lot going on here in my laboratory at Mass University, I'm trying to understand and improve protein digestibility of noble alternative protein foods. I love it. So here's a diet score to give you an idea about which ones of these are better for health in terms of providing more nutrition, more digestibility. So the ones which are uh, the proteins or the food sources which are in green, they uh, look at their diet score. A diet score of 100 or more is considered best in terms of um, their digestibility. So mostly you will see animal protein-based foods there. So egg has a diet score of 101 pork 117, chicken 108, beef 112. Very high diet scores, so a very high digestibility of animal-based foods. That's why they are known to be better um, you know, for health in terms of their, um, their providing more nutrition. But apart from that, you also see potato protein in there. So although potato protein concentration is very low in potatoes, but potato protein is as bioavailable as animal protein. So it's a very high quality protein. Similarly, soy is very high quality as well. It's not far behind potato. But if you look at kidney beans, you know, the diet score is a little bit lower than those animal protein sources. And the worst diet score is for corn, which is 36, wheat, 48, hemp, cooked oat, 54, very low diet score. So apart from digestibility or the you know, diet score, apart from that, there is a limiting amino acid, which means that these amino acids, which are, um, you know, I mentioned here, they are either not present in that source or they are not present in enough quantities which are needed to fulfill our nutritional daily, daily nutritional needs. So if you keep on consuming soy, then you'll become deficient in methionine and cysteine. But there are no limiting amino acids. Look at the potato protein. There is no limiting amino acids. It's a high quality protein. But look at corn, look at rice. There's lysine is the main um, limiting amino acid there. So we have been testing food protein digestibility using the models that you can see on the right-hand side. We have these glass reactors. Um, we want to know more and more about digestibility of the foods that we create because more digestibility is better for health. Higher rates of amino acid release. So when the protein is broken down into amino acids, so the rate at which the amino acids are released, that can lead to anabolic effects in muscle and therefore a gain in muscle mass or a reduction in sarcopenia in the elderly. You might have seen that our grandmothers and grandfathers, they, they lose their muscle mass as they age. So for them, it's very important that they consume a very high quality protein for which the high, there is the, the rate of amino acid release is very high. But there's little information available about adjustability of or digestion kinetics of new emerging sources of proteins or foods. Okay, we know that you know cereals, they have very low um, protein digestibility. What, what now? We need to work with them. We need to work with whatever is sustainable, but how can we make that sustainable? Uh, how can we make that more healthy? 
So we have published this article, review article in 2022. Um, it's basically comparing alternative proteins with animal proteins and the influence of structure and processing on their digestion. Recent research has shown that it is possible to modify protein structure through processing to achieve digestibility. So we have, in our laboratory, we have been working with um, a lot of different techniques, physical modification, um, you know, and many other types of you know, fermentation, things like that, um, to improve digestibility of plant-based proteins. So therefore, it matters not just what you eat, but also how it is made. Because what, how you're processing your food is going to affect um, its digestibility and its nutritional value. So again, um, I'm showing the models that we are using for our studies. We have static model, which is the glass reactors on the right-hand side. And also we have a semi-dynamic model. I'll show a tiny video to show its functioning. So this is a semi-dynamic gastric model that we use. So we add our food in there. And this model is capable of mimicking the peristaltic movements of the stomach. So here at the moment, we have added meat in there. So it mimics the peristaltic movements that happen in our stomach when we consume food. So what we do is we subject food to this uh, treatment. We add all the enzymes which are normally present in our food, uh, sorry, in our, uh, in our body. And then we take out sample at different intervals and test for how much that has broken down over time. So because there's a lot of a lot going on on um, you know meat analogs um, and um, and meat, so there was we wanted to test whether the meat that has the same digestibility as the plant-based um, meat alternatives. So therefore, we wanted to compare uh, meat, three different cuts of meat versus the Beyond Burger, which is a meat analog, which is purely based on um, plants, plant protein. So we use these reactors and we subjected um, all of these cuts in the, in the plant-based uh, patties to, the, to digestive, to digestion, in vitro digestion system, and both alone and also in the form of, we created a meal, like a tortilla meal, and we subjected to human gastric simulator. So I'm presenting the results for the static model here. So we found that for protein digestion, there was not much effect of whether, sorry, I didn't mention that we also compared um, when you raise the cattle on pastures or when you grain feed uh, your cattle, um, whether that can affect digestibility of the meat. But we found, no, it doesn't matter whether the cattle or animal has uh, been pasture raising or has been pasture raised or grain finished. Um, it didn't affect uh, the way the meat was digested. But we did find that the based meat alternative, which is quite a popular one, the one that we chose, Beyond Burger, is a US-based uh, meat uh, analog. It performed really poorly in protein digestion experiments. And this work was again featured um, in the media and also featured on New Zealand National TV. So this slide tells about how you can improve protein digestibility to different methods um, of physically modifying the protein using, um, using, using different technologies that I mentioned, high pressure processing, pulse electric field, electroporation, ultrasound, cavitation, uh, thermal processing, enzymatic modification, uh, chemical modification. There are more. There's fermentation, which is not mentioned here um, as well. So there are different ways um, to look at how we can improve protein digestibility using these technologies. So this is an example comparing the, um, the effect of high pressure processing on digestibility. So, um, so this is the raw meat, um, which is raw and subjected to in vitro digestion. So it has good digestibility. But when you cook the meat for 10 minutes at 100 degrees centigrade, similar to how we cook our curries, 
So we reduce the digestibility. So you see this is the gastric or this is the small intestinal phase. Digestibility was significantly reduced. But if you cook for 30 minutes instead of 10 minutes, you're further reducing the digestibility. So this means that how we are cooking the meat affects our digestibility, um, the digestibility of the meat or any protein-based food material. But here, here is high pressure processing. Use high pressure processing. The digestibility doesn't decrease in the gastric phase, but if you look at the intestinal phase, rather than in, uh, decreasing, it increased. So therefore, these emerging technologies, they have a role to play in improving the health aspects of the food materials as well. Similarly, when we used PEF technology, which is pulse electric field, we found that the protein digestibility of meat was improved by 18% and by 29% as well. So this is the last topic where we looked at um, you know, kiwi fruit on how that improves the just digestion of plant proteins. So we produce a lot of kiwi fruit here in New Zealand, um, green kiwi fruit and sun gold kiwi fruit. And this was funded by Zespri, which is the largest um, grower of fruit in New Zealand. Um, so why we, are in, we were interested in um, kiwi fruit, because kiwi fruit contains an enzyme which is called actinidin, which is highly proteolytic enzyme, so it can break down protein. And when the study was carried out, um, Zespri, they launched um, the new, I'm not sure if you know Sun Gold or if you have tasted that, but this is a new variety um, of kiwi fruit, um, which is now available everywhere. It also contains actinidin, um, like the green kiwi fruit, although not that much, but it also contains um, vitamin C and E, potassium and fiber, et cetera. So we, we, we did some work with green kiwi fruit earlier as well in 2010, and this, was, this work was featured on um, Daily Mail. And this time, uh, Zespri wanted us to do um, more work comparing Sun Gold, which is a which was a, you know recently launched at that time. So we we hypothesized that if um, you know the digestion of animal food proteins, uh, sorry, the digestion of plant based proteins would be enhanced uh, when you add kiwi fruit extract along with those protein sources. So what we tested was pea protein, quinoa, almonds, and tofu. And we prepared a crude extract of kiwi fruit. We did in vitro digestion and we analyzed the digests. So what we found was, um, so this is the gel. Um, I'll go through the gel very quickly. So this is for pea protein isolate because everybody seems to be working with pea protein. So it's a good idea to see how that digests and whether if you consume your pea protein along with the green kiwi fruit or sun gold kiwi fruit, whether that'll help in digestion of that protein. So this is a pea protein without anything, without digestion. So this is when you digest normally without um, consuming anything. So this is a protein which is um, uh, digested in the presence of sun gold kiwi fruit. And this is a protein which was um, digested in the presence of green kiwi fruit. So what does this mean that there was nothing left, it was all digested. So there was a strong effect that we saw um, in case of pea protein, strong effect of, um, of the enzyme which is present in normal um, you know, green or kiwi fruit extracts. So we found that the breakdown of all protein, pea protein isolate protein, uh, sorry, all pea protein isolate proteins was um, considerably improved when either green or gold kiwi fruit extracts was present whether alone or along with pepsin. Similarly, we found the enhanced digestion in case of tofu as well. And similarly, almonds as well. So th those results were really encouraging. Um, so the benefits, we can say that the benefits of actinidin in improving protein digestion are conferred in two ways. In case of impaired digestive system, which is in case of elderly, which may not produce that much of the digestive enzymes, 
the actinidin, which is present in the kiwi fruit, will compensate for the loss of natural digestive ability. In normal systems, it will speed up the rate of protein dehydrolysis, resulting in more rapid release of amino acids and thus higher bioavailability. So in vivo studies are at the moment being done to confirm these findings. So we can say that um, multiple factors, they affect digestibility of proteins in a food system. Rate of protein digestion is important in addition to quality scores. The type and intensity of processing, what technology you're using, and what's the intensity of the technology that you're using that's going to affect how uh, the protein is going to be digested or the food is going to be digested in the body and its bioavailability as well. So more research is needed to be focused on converting through processing the undigestible or resistant protein into rapidly digestible or slowly digestible protein to achieve better health outcomes. So further research is required in understanding and improving protein digestibility of novel alternative protein foods that we are looking at creating in the future. So these are the challenges for emerging technologies. Um, so there's high initial capital investment, of course. The industry is not ready to cope with that, you know, but they need to invest a lot of money. Um, and most of these technologies like high pressure processing, mats, they're still batch processes. And this can add to cost when compared to continuous processing techniques. And some of them, they require speciality packaging. And also, as I mentioned before, regulations and safety requirements. So process validation and documentation would be required before we can implement those technologies in the food industry with FDA or ANZFSA or EFSA. So that concludes my lecture and my acknowledgements to my colleagues, my students, and to my funders, my collaborators. And um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was a very different uh, uh, experience we had with your presentation. Uh, the way of presentation as well as the graph that has been placed and the preparation of slide were really self-explanatory. Uh, earlier, we thought that when achieving a sustainability uh, for 25 years was a huge time. But once we gone through the challenges that you have told, we think that it is a very short to achieve the sustainability, especially the converting the animal-based uh, uh, alternatives to plant-based, shifting it is a bit challenging for us. With that too, with the zero carbon emission processing, uh, is somewhat uh, difficult. And uh, another thing is that the high processing cost, uh, the cost of high processing technologies uh, are a bit huge. So switching over from traditional to emerging technology is also uh, a bit challenging. And uh, some of the interesting fact that we had been uh, told that the Moringa that we grow huge, that is the world's dense food. That was the interesting fact that we had and the Manuka plant that was also very interesting. And the artificial, uh, the stomach that you have been told, the digestibility of the artificial stomach and uh, the key protein uh, isolates and its digestibility. Those were very interesting. Uh, really, uh, it was a very unique experience that we had uh, in this session. Uh, we had uh, some queries uh, like in this session. Uh, some of the queries had been asked about uh, how conventional technologies are advanced. Dr. Srinivas, it is noisy. No, Dr. Srinivas. Yes, sir. It's yes. noisy. I don't know what something is going on behind. Bit oh. noisy. Okay. Now, now, sir. Yeah. Now? Yeah, now. Now it's okay. Okay. Now, is it fine, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it audible for you, ma'am? Yeah, okay. So the first question was how conventional technologies are advantageous on uh, emerging technologies in terms of quality. Those who have been explained uh, briefly in this session, but we want to have a gist about uh, these quality aspects once again, ma'am. 
the challenge would be whether the consumer would be ready um, to, to accept the texture or uh, the appearance of the foods which are processed using emerging technologies. The quality, I mean, for the conventional sources, uh, for, the, for, for the conventional processing, we already know and the consumer already accepts that. You know, we day-to-day -day life, we usually consume food which is processed using those conventional methods and we pretty much like that we're pretty much used to that but the challenge is not not that but the challenge would be whether we'll be able to switch over um you know when we change textures or do we need to produce foods with similar textures that we are used to using emerging methods so that will be the challenge yes that's fine and we have another uh, question uh, that can microwave cooking of meat result in same uh, maillard reaction and flavor development as in traditional cooking method so they are asking about the quality uh, when we cook with a microwave very good question but we haven't explored that <laughs> i'm thinking that uh, there'll be different flavor compounds which would be released Using microwave processing so that's coming from because, because we are using microwave energy and um we all know that we all use microwaves at home and hang on sorry so and we all know that um uh, this you know when you when you cook food in microwave it's very different than when you cook food using your normal cooking method so the flavor profile is different so i'm assuming that the flavor profile would be different although we haven't tested that we have just published that paper where we compared the texture but we haven't tested um, the flavor. Um, and yeah, Maillard reaction again, you know, so it'll be, um, yeah, so depending on the temp Maillard reaction highly depends on the temperature and the time. So we have reduced the time and we are using a very different technology than conventional, um, you know, the thermal processing. Uh, I'm assuming that the Maillard reaction uh, would, would occur to a less extent, and therefore the flavor profile would be different because all the flavor is because of the Maillard reaction. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, the another is uh, regarding the regulatory measures. Uh, is there any regulatory restrictions to use a plant extracting meat processing? I don't think so. Uh, there will be uh, regulatory measures, but is there any view on this, ma'am? Yes, yes. Um, so that's what we are doing. And that's the challenge we are facing at the moment. We are doing a lot of work in the area of, um, you know, using Manuka oil and extract and Kanuka oil and extract for food preservation. And we, we have tested and we found really positive results that the, both those extracts, they are, uh, they are very high in antimicrobial compounds and they have very strong antimicrobial properties and they have very, very strong even more strong than those chemical uh, preservatives which are being used, um, you know, but the challenge would be, we can't just add in the food materials. We'll have to get those approved. So we'll have to do some, um, that's what I think we will be doing next. But we would need to work out the toxicological studies to make sure there are no bad effects on health of those extracts in the world. Having said that, so those, um, you know, extracts, they have already been used um, uh, for making teas and things like that by the early settlers, as I mentioned in the slides. But still, if you are using, they're trying to use very concentrated extracts or compounds from those uh, those plants, then still you need to go through those regulatory approvals. So that's the challenge. But only so far, what I know is only rosemary or extract is the one that has been approved in Europe for adding into food materials. But there's always... Uh, concentration limit that you need to stick to. You need to stay within that limit uh, for adding into the food materials. So the limitation plays a vital role there. So the, the next question now is, uh, are there any sta global standards for 3D food products? 
global standards global standards uh, i think it's a very new technology and it has huge challenges um although you know if you look at social media you will see you know this and that company has been coming up with um uh, you know new product using 3d printing but i'm not sure how you know how large scale that can be because the speed of 3d printing uh, still more research is needed to improve the speed because if you need to print a steak i think it will take a whole day <laughs> to print just one steak so uh, there's still i think more um research needed and more advancement needed in um, the use of 3d printing but yeah we have started research so we'll be there but yeah that that's what we we are in the exploration phase at the moment yeah uh, i do had some question on uh, 3d printing in the slides you have mentioned that, that the polymers are used uh, in the uh, during the 3d printing uh, is it right uh, that the polymers are used and is it safe to be used in 3d yeah. printing Well, I, I didn't mean chemical uh, polymers. So, like starch is a polymer. You know, proteins they're polymers. So, by natural polymers, which you normally use in case of foods, I didn't mean those. Yeah, those chemical or synthetic polymers. Okay. So yeah. uh, th there is one more question: How actinidin in gold kiwi fruit improves the digestibility of uh, other foods? In what way improves the activity of? other proteinases yes yeah, so this was a funded work so we did what was what we were paid for <laughs> we just tested those four uh, four foods we didn't test the any of the other foods um so i'm i'm thinking because we when we tested in 2010 when we tested just the green kiwi fruit and um its effect on meat uh on gluten i think there were, there were nine different sources whey protein and you know so on they were mainly animal foods um the effect was huge hugely positive and for the plant based foods the effect was hugely positive as well and sun gold oh, despite containing people. less enzyme was still quite effective in digesting those um those proteins and i'm oh, yeah. i'm thinking that uh it will still have um effect on other uh proteins as well but we have done some research but the less effect is found in case of soy soy protein so more effect in case of um animal proteins and pea protein you know was like amazing we were surprised to see that yeah yeah ma'am uh, there is another question in macano enzymatic digestibility those peristaltic movement is mechanically possible and whether is there any correlation between movement and digestibility no we did not test um different movements because we stick to movements uh, the rate at which you know the movements at uh, the, the rate at which movements normally occur in our body so we did not test uh, higher rates or lower rates we just um you know use literature um to use the rate which is not you know normally in our human body um so what was the other part sorry uh, that was the correlation between the movement as well as uh, uh what's it what is the correlation between the movement and digestibility that has been asked yeah we just tested one speed which norm which we think that normally is there in the human body yeah okay. and there is another question if we consider green and the gold kiwi whether the ripened or the mature fruit having more enzyme which has got a more enzyme they ask mm good question i can't answer on top of my head um i think i uh, i think there should be plenty of information available uh online on zespri's website as well uh because i didn't do that research so i yeah i can't answer that so okay ma'am uh, that's fine and uh, there is another question about the sensory properties uh, between the 3d food as well as the original food product uh, they are asking about whether they will be the same in actually both in both oh uh, they are very different at this stage they are very different so we are trying to get that texture we going uh, we are trying to get the taste 
but at the moment we haven't got there. So we still need more research, more and more research to get the texture because getting the chicken-like texture or meat-like texture, which is already very complex, is really hard, you know, but we are making progress. We'll get there one day. Thank you, ma'am. These are the questions we had and it was a great time for us to be with you and to have uh, such a great knowledge for uh, uh, interacting with great knowledge with you. Now I request our beloved Dean, Dr. Lakshminar and Hagade to share his views on this uh, presentation. So over to you, sir, please. Thank you. Ma'am, it was a fantastic one. You took us to a different world altogether. Beautiful. It's a uh, beautiful opportunity for us. Ma'am, I have a, got a general question. What's your presumption whether uh, in future it, it be uh, vegan food uh, preference would be uh, more or these uh, as usual the meat uh, eaters will be more? I'm told that in Western and the developed countries, more people are moving towards vegan. What do you feel about this? So your question is whether um, vegan or vegetarian would yep. be more prevalent in the future. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, uh, yes. Um, I think because um, from food sustainability point of view, all animal foods, um, they'll be niche in the future. So even milk would be, you know, would be quite expensive in the future. Um, all those animal foods, whether it's egg, whether it's fish, whether it's um, meat. So I think from sustainability point of view, we would need to come up with all those analogs which are based on plants, you know, for all these foods. So I think in the future, vegan would be more prevalent in my understanding. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Because vegetarians, they can consume. Um, I'm vegetarian, but I consume milk. But for, I mean, there's no future for me as well. Because <laughs> in the future, milk would be, uh, be scarce as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. much. There are plenty of questions, I believe. But uh, we'll put it in the you know, box and uh, we'll get the uh, you know, uh, reply from you, ma'am. So that uh, so many hand, hand, uh, hands are uh, raised here. We'll get back to you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. From my be side. happy to uh, answer those questions if you could send those to me. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your kind yeah. words and for the opportunity. It was really yeah. great, um, you know, presenting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. One more. It's uh, from the college point of view. Whether our students, B Tech, we we give the B Tech for technology degree. Whether uh, our students will get the any opportunity as short term training or the internship type in your university. Whether it's possible because yes, we have uh, a four months uh, internship program here at, at the final year of their uh, pro degree. Whether any, any opening will be there in your university? So we do have collaboration with many universities across uh, the globe, okay. uh, where students come here and then they do part of the degrees and so on. But this is uh, this will require a lot of approvals and everything. You need to go through the whole process. Uh, okay. Having said that, it's not impossible. So we usually do that. So it's possible. It's worth exploring. I think. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, that was a fruitful time that we have spent with you. Uh, our next technical session will be start. So uh, we'll start from two p.m. Uh, there are the two uh, topics will be dealt. That is a future foods as well as the emerging non-thermal technologies in food processing. So I request all the participants uh, to join the next session by 1.50 p.m. Thank you very much. We will be back at uh, exactly 1.50. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am.